little something for the ladies. Now I'm also available on alternative social media on MeWe, James Desborough, all one word, on Minds, Grimachu. I'm no longer on Gab, I've deleted my account because it's even more exhausting than Twitter. Oi. Hello lovelies. I fell out of the habit of reading for various reasons in recent years, so this year I decided to kind of force myself to read at least a chapter a day of, of something, anything. I do a lot of reading for work, and so it makes reading into a, a bit of a chore, really. Do you know that saying, that if you find something you love to do as a job, you'll never work another day in your life? Bollocks. Everything becomes work, <laughs> particularly if it's, if it's your hobby, something you do to relax and you turn it into work you turn it into your hustle, uh, then everything you ever do becomes work. Unfortunately, um, that has its upsides and its downsides. But the latest thing I finished reading is The Fiends in the Furrows, an anthology of folk horror. This kept coming up in my recommendations on Goodreads and basically anything that shows you something you, you might want to buy algorithmically seemed to come up with this. And a few people I, I know spoke well of it. You know, I follow a lot of authors. So I decided to give it a go, and it's a collection of ten short stories, uh, edited by David Neal and Christine Scott. Uh, the authors are this is important stuff, you know. Um, Coy Hall, Sam Hicks, Lindsay King Miller, Steve Toes, T O A S E, uh, Eric Guignard, 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 to know something like that. Uh, Romy Petit, cool name. Stephanie Ellis, Zachary Von Hauser, and S.T. Gibson. You know, just in case you wanted to, to look any of them up. And the stories are entitled... Uh, Sire of the Hatchet, Back Along the Old Track, The Fruit, The Jaws of Ouroboros, The First Order of Whaleyville's Divine Basilisk Candlers, Pumpkin Deer, The Way of the Mother, Leave the Night, and Revival. Not that that tells you a great deal, but I'm not really going to tell you much in the way of the plots of the stories or their content in particular, uh, because spoilers, frankly. So what, what is folk horror? Folk horror is, well, to me, speaks to something like The Ritual or The Wicker Man um, or The Devil Rides Out or The White Worm. Yeah, the, those those kind of things. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a British tradition in horror in a lot of ways. I think you'll find that a, a great deal of British horror fiction taps into this one way or the other in terms of overall themes and mood and it's generally about this clash between ancient pagan ideas and, and mythicism and relics and artifacts of that time, cultural or physical, and modernity or Christianity. So I'm from Britain as, as you may be able to tell, my historical speciality really is, is pre-Christian Britain. Christianity didn't really come to the UK until 100 AD, or Common Era, I, I should say. Um, and that was only sort of weekly via Romans, who were, who were part of the Christian cult at the time. It didn't really get traction though until about 600 Common Era, uh, when St Augustine came over to the United Kingdom and, and started spreading Christianity. Then it kind of caught on. But while we've had our witch hunters and our destruction of ancient pagan sites and all the rest of it, like a lot of other people, Britain is a bit weird. This does happen in other countries, but in the United Kingdom, a lot of pagan traditions and Christian traditions kind of intermingled and came together. So you'll find places and you'll find villages, um, e even towns, even cities, where ancient pagan rites are still conducted, albeit with a smattering of Christianity on top, like well blessings, where you, you venerate the source of water, maybe you make some offerings to it, or garland the well with flowers or whatever else, and then the priest will just kind of stop by and spray a bit of holy water and mumble some Latin and, and wander off to lend a certain respectability. <laughs> to the whole thing. Uh, the the Obios um, still chases maidens in, in many a village. Morris dancing has its roots in paganism, though we might want to um, pretend that it doesn't. 
And we have Celtic influence, we have Pictish influence, we have continental influence, we have Norse influence, and it all forms this big syncretic melange of, of nonsense. Um, but I, I quite like the fact that we've managed to hold on to these traditions and, and some of this history and some of this background. And it does make very ripe ground in which to sow your, your horror or fantasy seeds, I think. So that's what I think folk horror is and what it is rooted in. Um, and I think it makes me hypercritical of folk horror. There are quite a few stories in this that I don't think are particularly folksy. There's quite a few stories in this that I don't think really fall into horror either. So overall, I was quite disappointed, not necessarily at the quality of the stories per se, but that the, the content, the nature of the stories did not match up to what I was expecting or what I was led to expect. Now, the the first story um, is very much what I, I would have expected. It has that clash between relative modernity and paganism, between Christianity and paganism, and it does play out of all the stories most like a horror story. Others, not so much. Perhaps Back Along the Track also does. It has a kind of Lovecraftian vibe early Lovecraft so a little bit more blatant a little bit less existential than a lot of his work but after that it doesn't necessarily feel folksy and it doesn't necessarily feel like horror it feels more surreal or kitsch even um, the fruit in particular is just surreal it's not really horrific um, Pumpkin Deer is more like a a dark fairy story than a than a horror story um, or a folk horror story, and there's an American influence on a lot of this. And when I think of folk horror, I do not think of America. The America doesn't have that that depth of history. There are the the Indian stories, sorry, the Native American stories and mythology, things like the Wendigo and so on, that you could perhaps call folk horror. But folk horror to me tends to be associated with a current community, something behind the scenes or some ancient evil or, or whatever that you still need to make an offering to. It's interwoven into the community. It's, it's tradition, I guess. And when you overwrite and eliminate an old culture, I don't think that's quite the same thing but like I said maybe I'm being hypercritical because this this is my area <laughs> um, the best example of what I mean there is the first order of Whaleyville's divine basilisk handlers um, I don't want to give too much away but you know that there are churches that handle rattlesnakes and things as, as proof of their faith and um, taking bits of the, the Bible rather literally uh, that's kind of about that, but with basilisks. Where do the basilisks come from? Eh. Why do they exist? Eh, don't know. I mean, these are short stories. You don't expect a whole lot of background. But I often felt a drift in these stories, uh, especially this, the more surreal ones, where there was just no explanation whatsoever as to how this situation came about. Uh, often there was no real conclusion to the stories. They they didn't feel complete. It was like coming in in the middle of a story and then leaving before the end a, a lot of the time. I think while it's short stories, and I like short stories, they didn't feel fully encapsulated within themselves for the, for the most part. So... It, <sighs> I'm being particularly picky and fussy. I, I recognise that and I understand that, but it just it just wasn't for me. It was rather disappointing, apart from a couple of the stories which I which I thought were particularly good, certainly standing out against the others, and those would be Sire of the Hatchet and Back Along the Old Track, the the two first first stories in the book. Um, presentation wise it's all it's all very nice is it published by nose touch press um, it has this kind of woodcut effect for for various illustrations 
um, within. Not that there's many; they're just kind of chapter breaks, really. But it, it's it's a it's a nice look, and it does help evoke the feel. The, the stories don't necessarily do. Um, it would have been nice to have some old sort of storybook style plates in that same style, rather than just title pages. But you can't have everything. Uh, style. I think it misses the mark when it comes to the stories, but the presentation is very good, but could have been better. So I would have to give it a style score of a of around three. Need, needs improvement, but that's sort of sort of bang on average for me. I mark one to five, and three is slap bang in the middle. In terms of substance, two of the stories are good, but not great. Uh, several of them feel like they missed the mark to me. So I think for, for substance, considering all of that together, I can only give it a two. So three for style, two for substance. That is five out of ten, or two and a half stars out of five. Um, I'm being picky. You might have more luck with it. But it's not too bad. And as is often the case, when I get frustrated with something, it inspires me to do something similar, but better. Zang. Machinations of the Space Princess is an old school RPG with a sci-fi setting. The rules are familiar and at once innovative. Opened up so you can play literally any alien species you can envision. Purchase it at RPGNow or Lulu.com.